morning, Covenant Church Online, and happy Resurrection Sunday. Whether it is your first time joining us, or if you've joined us before, whether that's on YouTube or Facebook, we just wanna say what such a blessing it is for you to join us this morning. And we are excited for the worship and the special message from Pastor Mike. But before we get started, here are a couple of announcements for you. First, if you missed the posts on social media pages or the previous announcements, we are going to want you to get your phones out and mark this event down. Or as Mike says, wives, go ahead and mark this down for your husbands. The Collision Men's Conference is going to be held here at the church on April 27th from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. We've got tons of great activities planned for you guys like axe throwing, a golf simulator, plenty of food obviously, worship, and a word from our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is Ron Archer, a dynamic speaker, pastor, evangelist, voice for the unborn, father, and former NFL chaplain, and he will be focusing on the five B's of manhood. One, be present. Two, be attentive. Three, be affirming. Four, be constant. And five, be committed. And he will be joining us for these Sunday services, preaching in both services as well. For all of the information and to get signed up, go head over to the church website, covenantchurch.church, or you can find it on our official church app. Ron Archer sent us a quick video about his excitement for the conference. Check it out. Men of Covenant Church, this is Dr. Ron Archer, and I cannot wait to see you guys in April, man. I got so many things to share with you. So many things I've experienced this past year. One, I've lost 120 pounds uh, doing keto, intermittent fasting, affirmations, visualization. But beyond that, I got a message from men. I wrote a book called The Power of One Man. How God uses men like you to change the world. You know, whenever God wanted to do something great, he called out to one man. When God wanted to save the world from a flood, he called out to Noah. When God wanted to create the Jewish people, he called out to Abraham. When God wanted to set the Hebrews free from bondage, he called out to Moses. When God wanted to save his family from starvation, he called out to Joseph. When God wanted to spread the gospel of the Gentile, he called out to one man. His name was Paul. When God wanted to save the world from sin, he became one man. You see, God has never called the qualified. He qualifies who we call. God uses imperfect people to reach other imperfect people, which is a perfect work. Please, you got sons, you got cousins, you got grandfathers, you got dads, get them to Covenant Church in April. We have a life-changing transformer. I'm talk about health. I'm going to talk about mentality. I'm going to talk about championship building. I'm going to talk about legacy. I'm going to talk about how to change pain into power. You know, we often talk about generational curses. We're going to talk about generational blessings. Get the men there. Get your sons there, your grandsons there. I promise you, I promise you, if you get them there, come to church in April, it'll be a transformative change the head, heart, the hands, and the habits of their humanity. This is Dr. Ron Archer, and I'm so fired up! I can't wait to see you. Next, coming up as well in April, our annual student barbecue fundraiser. This fundraiser is held yearly to give our students the opportunity to help pay for trips and activities to help them step outside of the walls of the church to serve, engage, and impact the world around us. The student ministry here is thriving with new students every week and we couldn't be more excited. So join alongside them and purchase a ticket for only $10. The plate will include pulled pork, slaw, baked beans, chips, buns, and a dessert. And all the proceeds will head to our student ministry to support or lower the cost of outings and activities. Tickets can be purchased on the website, as always, or outside of the sets of doors following each service. And you can also deliver to your company for 10 plus plates or more. 
So make sure you bring it up at work to your bosses or just buy lunch for the office and help out our students for this fundraiser. April 7th, Covenant Kids and Covenant students are taking over Sunday service. We are so excited for all the kids and all the students to partner with our adult teams to serve in various ways, like with the greeters, security, opening, closing, the whole service, even worship, and plenty more on this special day. Sunday, we are calling it Next Gen Takeover Sunday. Kids and students will be everywhere, and we are so excited to minister to our congregation in this way. And I'm so excited for this Sunday to be the first time I get the opportunity to bring the word to the church as a whole, not just the students. Be ready and come expecting for a Sunday that you will not forget. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my gym shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, always something going on. All right. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Coming to church it is the day to celebrate the risen King. Uh, and we are just so glad that you're with us today. Resurrection Sunday. Um, it is something that uh, I pray today is not just a day we, we celebrate at one time, uh, but it is something we live in every day for sure. And so I'm Pastor Aaron. Glad that you're here. And uh, we just want to welcome you here if it's uh, a week in and week out thing. We're glad that you're here. But also if you're here for the first time, uh, we are blessed and honored that you're here with us. We would like to connect with you a couple of different ways if we could uh, or one of two ways. Uh, you can take out your phone and text the word new to 704-735-1559. It'll prompt you along, allow you to uh, just give us some information, answer a few questions, let us know how we may can walk alongside of you, um, how we can uh, answer anything you may need. Uh, and there's a connection card on the back of some of the chairs uh, that you have in front of you. If you take that connection card, you can fill it out, uh, or you can wait to fill it out outside, but there's a welcome center that'll be it's right outside the door under the covering we would love to meet you whether you do it by phone or have the car just bring it with you um, we can get one to give you a gift give you some information also maybe answer some questions about our children's ministry youth ministry the other ministries that are here there's a lot going on as you see just these few announcements uh, there's newsletters outside the doors that will give you some more information it has a QR code on there as well uh, that can give you information about life groups and just everything that we, we have going on here we're blessed um, and uh, we just got a lot of things that, uh, that are happening. But uh, today, uh, we're here not to talk about the, all those things because every one of them, I pray they point to the one that we're here to celebrate today. That's what we're here for today. So whether you're in this room or whether you're on live stream, welcome. We're glad that you're with us today. Uh, we've got several things that, uh, that are going to happen in here today, but uh, and out in the lobby, uh, just to kind of piggyback on the barbecue thing, if you see what I've done there, um, we... Um, Pastor Adam's going to be out in the lobby. Students, if you haven't got tickets yet, please be out there. Uh, go out and get those from him. Also, there's company orders opportunities. If you work at a company, he'll have those out there and need to sign those out. But he, he'll be out there right after service and can take care of that. Uh, if you're a regular attendee at Covenant, our giving boxes are at the back at the doors uh, with envelopes there as well. So you can put those in as you leave. Also, there'll be some... Um, communion cups. If you didn't get one, maybe during worship, if you want to grab one outside the doors, maybe to back at, uh, on a couple of tables if you need to grab that, if you missed it on the way in. All right. A lot of things going on. Um, in way of prayer request, I uh, got a call this morning and spoke to uh, Mr. Grady and Debbie. Uh, they lost their uh, daughter-in-law this morning. Um, she was in the hospital, uh, but made, had a turn for the worst 
uh, last night and then this morning about 4 a.m. Uh, passed away. So please uh, lift them and the family up and uh, just ask uh, that the Lord just surround them with his presence. Um, praying for, still praying for Tom and Karen and lifting them up and just praying for a miracle, praying that eyesight is going to happen and uh, it's going to continue to be restored. And then uh, Dad, uh, Nathan Grooms, he'll be having a surgery tomorrow to kind of help with the knee surgery that he previously had. He's going back in tomorrow uh, to uh, try to correct some things there. So we want to lift them up, okay? If you would, let's stand. I had uh, told for a playlist that was going on, told first service that this week just kind of put that on, just songs about the blood, the cross, um, just the resurrection, and just wanted to have that just surrounded, not just today, but the whole week. And, and so a, few, a lot of it just was catching my attention, just thinking of the blood and what it means to us and, um, you know, what it represents. But it was one song that just talked about uh, of how God, just, he robbed the grave. All right, he robbed the grave. But it said, the, the one other line in it that said that the grave was only borrowed for three days. All right, it was borrowed. All right, well, he knew that. It was just something we're just going to use for a short time. And we get to celebrate in that today. And so today as we go, I pray it's not something we just come in. And it is, it is Resurrection Sunday. It is a time that a lot of people come to church. But let me tell you something. Today is life-changing if you allow it to be. Because we come into the presence of God. We don't leave, we don't leave the same. And so I pray that you have open hearts and minds for that to happen today. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what today is. We celebrate the risen King. We celebrate you today, God. We honor you. The sacrifice, the obedience, the cross, the blood that came, the Calvary, God, we, we thank you for what it all represents and the opportunity for us to walk in a relationship with you. And so, Lord, today I pray that our, our hearts would be open. I pray that nothing else would be going on in our minds. I pray that we would just be able to focus on the word and the worship that we have today. And, Lord, I pray that we would not leave here the same way that we came in. God, I pray for those uh, prayer requests that we mentioned and those that we have not. Lord, I pray you would intervene, that your presence would fill the rooms, whether it's a, a surgery room, God, if it's a hospital room, God, if it's a room where they're just uh, having loss right now in a family and other things that are going on right now, Lord, across this room, I pray that you would let us be the hands and feet, and God, that you would just let your presence and your Holy Spirit minister in each one of those in mercy and grace. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's put our hands together and celebrate the resurrection this morning. It's Resurrection Sunday every day, but this is a particular day when we just want to focus on all that he's done by leaving that tomb and redeeming our life. Amen. Father, we thank you. We praise you. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drown in. Hey, look. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Yes, we do. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'll praise when I feel it. I praise when I don't. Hallelujah. I praise because I know. You're still in control Cause my praise is a weapon It's more than a sound My praise is the shout That brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise The Lord, oh my soul And I won't be quiet, my God is alive How could I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul
soul. Come on, let's put our hands together. Father, we praise you and exalt you, Lord, our risen King. You are so worthy, so worthy of our song. With everything we have, with all the breath that we have, we praise, we exalt, we lift you up, Lord. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody great. Come on, church. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How can I keep it inside? I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Let's sing it out. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Oh, we will praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Come on, guys. Yeah. Let everything that hath breath praise and exalt the Lord. If you've got breath in your lungs this morning, we owe him a praise. Come on, let's give him the praise he deserves. Father, we worship you. God, we exalt you, Lord. You are mighty in every way. Lord, we bless your name. Oh, we bless your name, mighty King. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Oh, we bless your name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him the shout of praise that he deserves. Father, we worship, we praise, we exalt, we lift you up, Lord. You are so worthy of praise, so worthy of our praise, Lord. Hallelujah, we bless your name. Look at the word of God with me and read. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth at last. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. And I am overwhelmed at the thought. For Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. And just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Signed by the blood that still speaks Now I'm forgiven, now I'm called righteous I'm made clean There on the cross of Calvary You gave it all to purchase me You are the Savior and the God Who set me free Transforming 
Great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work 
is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope, your living hope, God. Who could imagine so great a mercy? And what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages, He stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Grip on me, and you have broken every 
Aren't you thankful he's alive this morning? Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. I woke up this morning with uh, actually the lyrics that Carrie sang. I am a testimony of the goodness of the Lord. How many of y'all can say that in here this morning? I am a testimony of the goodness of the Lord. I'm so thankful that he gave his life for me. I am so thankful that he got up out of that grave. I am so thankful that I can call him friend this morning. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I am a testimony of the goodness of the Lord. Did you know that all of y'all are a testimony of the goodness of the Lord? I don't know if y'all can see what we see from up here. Man, y'all, y'all are such an encouragement to us. Y'all bring it. And I love that so much. But I'm watching you worship this morning, and you're, you're little, and you still have so much of life to live. But I want to tell you, even now, you're a testimony of how good God is. And so as we sing this next song, I just want us to declare the faithfulness of our Father. Let's join heaven this morning. Let's join heaven and sing about the name above all names. Amen. We bless you, Jesus.
our praise. Oh, we worship and exalt you, risen King. We worship and exalt you, our risen King. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of us need to do our once a year shout. <laughs> and just say, worthy are you, Lord Jesus. Woo, thank you, Jesus. It'd be an old praise song when I was in youth ministry that talked about breaking chains and shaking off stuff. And uh, sometimes you just got to jump and shake some stuff off. And uh, sometimes you just got to give out a shout that releases you from something. I don't, I don't know what it's going to release you from, but I'm telling you, if you shout to the Lord, if you will shout to the Lord once in a while, it'll just release you from something. You know what I'm saying? So worthy are you, Jesus. Worthy are you, Jesus. Holy are you, Lamb of God. You're worthy to be praised today. We come in this room because of you today. We thank you that the cross still stands and the blood still flows. We thank you that you're still seated on your throne. We thank you that the stone still rolled. Hallelujah. Because that stone still rolled and, and you're not there anymore. We got something to shout about. It's our Super Bowl today, y'all. <laughs> we get to celebrate his resurrection every day, but today's the day that we point to him and say, this one's the day that made every other day possible. In Jesus' name. I read something yesterday, I was, uh, just before I pray, and we're going to get started, but uh, technically, I guess we're already started, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> there was, it, was, it was kind of a meme, it was something on social media where it's like a government official was interviewing Joseph, the guy that had given Jesus his tomb. And they said, man, you're one of the richest guys in this whole region. Why do you want to give your tomb to him? Why do you want to give that? I mean, that's, that thing has value to it. And you, you know, you got, you got everything at your fingertips. And, and yet you'll give, you'll give your tomb away to this, this guy that, that you really, you know, nobody really knows a lot about. Why, why on earth would you do that? And he said, I, he said sir, it's not that big a deal. It's only for the weekend. And it was only for the weekend, amen? Because if it had been more than a weekend, we wouldn't be in here doing this, I promise you that. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that it was only for the weekend. And that today, as we stand in this room, you are alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Mm. My goodness. My goodness. Thank you all for the worship. If we could just get Anna to get a little ex more excited, I think it would change the whole way we worship. It's Communion Sunday as well. We're going we're gonna to celebrate our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords, and we're going to remember him like he told us to today at the end. So uh, I appreciate Brother Zed and his crowd for getting not only you in your right seats, but also doing this communion stuff every time. Uh, getting getting that stuff prepared here and Kathy and, 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 and others and I appreciate you guys so much um, whoo mm. I've already got to do this one time today so I'm excited we have a lot to be excited about and I want to thank you guys that are here today um, that are that may be visiting or whatever it's just, it's just a privilege for us to have you I know Aaron's already said that but it's it is a privilege for us to have you with us today the only the only thing about it that I have to really be careful of is the trap of the, the preacher trap for uh, for Sundays like Resurrection and uh, and for Christmas when you know more people are going to be here. If you're not real, real careful, you can fall into a trap of performance uh, because you don't want to blow it on a day like today if you're the pastor. But I'm thanking God that he just kind of releases me from that and just says, you know what, the name of Jesus is to be lifted high. Today's not about covenant. It's not about the pastor. I promise you, it's not about the worship team. It's about the one we worship. And, uh, and so we celebrate him today. Uh, one of the things that I know I've held on to um, most of my new Christian walk, uh, if, if you guys that are here every week, you kind of know my story because uh, as my wife often reminds me, as I tell my stories like 10 and 12 times each, uh, but that's so we'll remember them, okay? Or, or maybe it's so I can still remember them at this point in my life. But... Uh, I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was six years old, and uh, but, I, mean, I gave my heart to him when I was six. I gave my life to him when I was 24, and uh, one of the traits that's kind of 
comes to the forefront in my spiritual walk uh, that inspires me. I had a guy one time in, in youth ministry years ago. He had been here maybe twice, and uh, uh, and I was preaching, and, and we went into worship at the end, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, I haven't been to church too much in my lifetime. He said, but I've been here a few times. He goes, explain to me, how in the world do you stay this excited about Jesus? And, uh, and it it got me thinking, why do I stay so excited about Jesus? And uh, if I had to pick one trait, it would be gratefulness. It would be gratitude. It would be, because uh, I know me, and I knew me, and I know who I was. And while I was yet in my sin, Christ died for me. And, uh, and so uh, I, I know how messed up I really was. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Honestly, I'm grateful that he didn't quit when he could have. He, you know, there's so many things. We're going to talk a little bit about this in a few minutes. So many, Jesus had so many reasons. I mean, so many disappointments, so many hurts. Not, I mean, we're not just talking about the cross and the stripes and the crown of thorns and, and the horrific death he died. But even before that, there's so many things that, uh, that just, he had so many reasons to quit. You know, I believe, and not everybody believes this, but I do. I believe that Jesus could have said no. I really believe. I believe, I, you know, when he went to the night before, uh, he was betrayed and he was talking to his father. And he was literally sweating blood. And uh, he, he says to his dad, he says, is there any way that this cup can pass from me? You know, I, I almost believe that was a decision moment for him where he could have just said, you know what, I've had enough of this. I've, I've been treated with contempt. I've been shamed. I've, I've been, and, and it's getting ready to get worse. And and I think he could have walked away. And I, you know, I'm grateful today that he didn't walk away. And it, and it inspires me because he didn't quit on the thing that he was called to do. I don't want to quit on the thing I'm called to do. And and so my greatest motivation in life is not it's not just to be a, a Christian for my my wife uh, to see as a godly husband, and I have that goal, but that's not my greatest motivation. It's not just so my kids will see me as a, a, a godly father, and I do have that goal, but it's not my main goal. It's not just so you can see me as that, and I do have that goal, but, but that's not my main goal. My main goal is that I might honor and glorify him with my life like he has lived to me with his. The day that I got saved, I was six years old. Uh, my I was born in Lincolnton, uh, and... Uh, my dad had a, a decent job here in town, and uh, God got a hold of his heart, and uh, he picked up our whole family when I was three, uh, getting ready to be four years old, and just moved us to eastern North Carolina, five hours away, uh, to answer the call of God on his life. And um, I, I've often thought back to how courageous that was to leave the comforts of, I mean, my mom and dad had just built a house, and uh, my mom was working, my dad was working, my grandmother and my grandfather lived right beside of us, so we had a built-in babysitter, you know, and all of our grandkids kind of stayed with her, and they, they, they traded all of that for the call of God, and I'm glad they did. We, we ended up moving when I was that young, I can't, I can't remember exactly, uh, I think I was getting ready before, uh, to a little town called Vanceboro, North Carolina. Uh, if you don't know where Vanceboro is, you're probably not going to know where it is, unless you're going there, you ain't going to find it, Okay. Uh, Vanceboro is near Newburn. Y'all have heard of that. Some of y'all have heard of that. And uh, we lived there for a couple years. And uh, my dad started Bible College, Atlantic Christian College in Wilson. So we had to move to um, to a little town called Macklesfield. Now, Macklesfield is smaller than Vanceboro. So uh, I tell people that ask me about Macklesfield, I say, well, first off, you've probably heard of Wilson, which is about 15 miles away. But uh, my greatest, the greatest claim to fame for Macclesfield would probably be that if you stand on one end where it says Macclesfield City Limits Bird Sanctuary, I never did understand what that was, but I remember thinking when I moved into that town, what is a bird sanctuary? You know, it's like where they go worship. I don't know, but anyway. Uh, and so if you stand at that sign and you throw a rock, you can throw it to the flashing light in the middle of town. And if you stand at the flashing light in that middle of town, you can probably throw it out the other end of town past the other bird sanctuary sign. That's how small Macclesfield was. But I have some of the greatest memories of my life in that little town. And, and, and one of the greatest things of my whole life happened there. Uh, we were, my dad was pastor of church that started out with probably 35, 40 people. And uh, about a month or so in, it was up to 50, 60 people. I can't remember exactly how many, but... 
But there was a little move of God happening in this church uh, where a lot of the young people were getting saved. And, and so the kids that were like three and four and five years older than me, I would watch them pretty steadily come to the front and they would get saved. And uh, so we kept the baptism pool pretty full uh, at that church where we would baptize three and four kids at a time. And, and, I, and I remember thinking through it, maybe even as a six-year-old, how, man, this is something what's going on with these people. And why? Why is this happening to them? What's going on? And, and even as a six-year-old, I was able to like really just put into motion in my mind and think about what this meant exactly. And uh, so I, I remember, I'll never forget the week uh, that I decided as a six-year-old toward the end of my first grade year that this was going to be the week. I don't know why I thought it had to be on a Sunday that I did it. Maybe it's because that's what the other kids were doing. But I remember as a six-year-old uh, making a decision on my own. I never, ever sat at the front of the church, especially as a preacher's kid. You know, you do not do that because m my dad was bad to watch me when he was preaching. You know, like sometimes he would stop church and go. <laughs> we was one of those churches where at, when you, after church, uh, my dad would pray. And while he was praying, walk up the middle aisle and go to the door. Y'all been in these churches before, and everybody that left, he would shake their hand. And if I'd been particularly mad, bad that day in church, and I thought, I was wondering if my dad saw me, I would run up there and stand beside him while he was shaking hands with people, and I would shake hands with people. And y'all, I lost count a number of times. My dad would reach over and go, go home. I'll be there in a minute. And I was like, dang, he saw me. I don't remember what I did, but it was something. This particular day that I had decided today was my day, I'll never forget, I sat on the very front row, kind of like where Janet's sitting. And, uh, and, I, and I was the only kid on the front row. I was the only person on that front row. My parents probably were like, what in the world is going on here? They were probably thinking, what do you do now? You know, but, but I couldn't wait uh, to the end of that sermon. I have no clue what my dad preached about that, that week. I do know that the song that we played at the end was Just As I Am. I even remember what page number it was, page 62. In the first, second, and fourth verses. Uh, and, and I remember through the first verse, my heart going, <laughs> and, and, I, and I just, I mean, it was like, am I going to do what I'm going to do? I've thought about this every day of the week. Am I going to do this? And when it got about halfway through the second verse, I popped up, and I was like, I'm going. And my dad was about six three, six four, and he was standing on this first step, and he stepped down, and he went down and kneeled beside of me. He was still taller than me. And led me to Jesus right there in that in that, in that little church, and uh, I, I'll never forget that day. Something happened to me that day. Now uh, it was two things happened, uh, actually three. Uh, they scheduled me for baptism, which was uh, a moment where I could profess my faith publicly. Uh, number two, when you get baptized at this church, which I thought was pretty cool, they gave you a Bible. It was about this thick, and um, and I had already picked out weeks earlier than one I was gonna get. It had gold like pages on the side, like it was on my dad's desk, but you could see it from the side. It had gold, and I was like, "That's the one I'm getting." Some of you are thinking, "Was that why you got saved?" It, it had something to do with it a little bit, but <laughs> that wasn't the reason. And uh, and and so that that happened. Uh, that it, but but the other thing that happened was just kind of a, a transformation in me. I, 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 I thought differently. Um, but one of the things I was a little confused about as a six-year-old was that I thought at that moment, well, I'm saved now. Everything's going to be easy in life. <laughs> Wrong. Uh, if anybody ever told you that when you give your life to Jesus that all of a sudden it's going to be great, easy selling, that's not true. Uh, it was almost easier. I know I was only six before this, but it was almost easier not being a Christian than it was being a Christian and uh, as far as living life, because the enemy does begin to fight you some. And so I, I had some seasons. I, I had a lot of moments of repentance where I would say, oh, my God, that was a bad idea. And I'd do something wrong, get in trouble at school or fight with my brothers or something and say something I shouldn't say, say something I shouldn't have seen or whatever. I had a lot of moments where it was just, just this thing inside of me. It wasn't condemnation as much as it was conviction, but... Uh, there were seasons in that time frame after I was six years old when I got to middle school and high school and I just ran the opposite direction. I mean, just pretty much just ran away from God and did all kind of crazy stuff that just dishonored him completely. Uh, and, and then when I was 24 years old, when my dad passed, um, 
uh, I decided, man, if, if I'm going to do this, I got to do this. You know, I can't just keep playing this game I'm doing. I don't know what it was, religion. Uh, I, it was, it felt so disingenuous and fake to me that I just decided, you know, you, you, you prayed to give your heart to him. How about I give your life to him? And so, now, I won't sit here and tell you I've been perfect since, but I will tell you this. Uh, since that day out in that field when I was 24 years old, I don't remember a day in my life that I wasn't chasing him at some point during that day. Now, I've, I've had some mistakes. I've made some mistakes. I've had some bad attitudes. I've made some bad decisions. But, but since that day, I, I, I feel like there's been like some concrete moment in the middle of that day that I just decided I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to chase Jesus. I'm going to do this. And, and I just want to honor him with my life, you know. And the, and the motivation for that is gratitude, but it's, 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 it's mainly what I, I just... What I see in him, his, his willingness, his refusal to quit despite the odds stacked against him uh, has inspired me. And so when I was preparing for this sermon, it was going to be a completely different sermon. It was, it was uh, I'd heard a teaching from some other preacher and it, it motivated something in me. And, uh, and so I started picking out some Bible verses and I spent a fair amount of time reading through the Gospels, the accounts of the cross, the accounts of, of the trial, the, the cross, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when I was reading through them, this, something kept jumping off the page at me. It was like, man, what? Listen, this, he went through, I mean, his, his refusal to quit, I guess is what I'm trying to say. His refusal to quit in, in spite of all of the pain uh, that was inflicted upon him. And I'm, I'm not even talking about necessarily the, the beating yet, right? I'm talking about just... In general, what he went through, even even the the week leading to to him dying for me on the cross, uh, is is just astounding. And so I, I picked out seven things in that in that, in in, in, the, in the book of Luke that I just felt like were monumental moments that oftentimes can cause people to pull back on their faith and their pursuit of the Father that that he faced as well, but refused to quit. And the, the first one was. Uh, uh, a betrayal by a dear friend. Uh, you know, it talks about in Luke 24, verses 1 through 6, about Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss, which is, that's astounding to me. Why Why a kiss? You know, even Jesus asked, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I mean, it was like, I mean, how backwards is that? But so, sometimes we look at the story of Judas, and, and, and I want you to know that this hurt Jesus' heart. Sometimes we, we look at Judas and we think, well, the reason that Jesus washed his feet and fed him at the Last Supper was so that one of these days on Facebook or social media that we can have this little meme like uh, even, even Judas got his feet washed or even Jesus, Jesus washed even Judas' feet. But I want to tell you something. Jesus didn't wash Judas' feet so 2,000 years later we could, we could come up with a, a, a catchy phrase to put on social media. The reason Jesus washed the feet of, of, of Judas is because he was madly in love with him. That's right. they'd, they'd spent three years together. They had spent time building a relationship, and Jesus desperately loved Judas. Now, I'm not telling you that he didn't. I, I don't think that by the time he washed his feet that he had some idea, some inkling that Judas was going to be the guy. But I don't think he washed him just to make just so he could show out, so he could get birdie, you know, brownie points in heaven. I think he washed his feet despite the fact that he was going to betray him yeah. because he desperately loved him. Now, how many of us have had a moment in our, in our lifetime where we were going to do the right thing in this cer certain circumstances and, and maybe one of our friends hurt our feelings and we just gave up on that, that pursuit of that thing that, that maybe even God had called us to? Let me tell you something. This 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 kiss. This kiss broke Jesus' heart. It's a whole lot easier to get betrayed by somebody that hates you or you know that you you're not friends with. It's 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 easier to get betrayed by somebody that you don't care that much about in a way where you built a relationship with them for three years. It it'll be very very it would be very very difficult to get betrayed by somebody that was that was supposed to be one of your best friends. And I thought, man. This would be enough for some people just to say, you know what, I've, I'm done. I, I, I've poured my life into this guy. I, I've, I've, I've walked all over the universe with this guy. 
I have done everything I could do to make him know that I'm the son of God and to make him know I love him. And at the end of the day, this is what I get. A kiss of betrayal. How many, how many of us have been hurt by people and decided to stop a pursuit of the Father because of what happened in that relationship? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad today that Jesus didn't say, well, that hurt my feelings, I quit. It gets worse. It, not only was he betrayed by a dear friend, but he was betrayed by a brother. Y'all are thinking, you mean James? No, I'm talking about Peter. Uh, Peter had a different kind of relationship with him. How many of you guys, you know, by raising your hand, how many of you guys have people that, that God has led into your life that you feel like they're family now? I mean, they're not blood kin, but they're family. I mean, you love them like, like, a, like, a, like a brother. You know, you love them like a sister. I have some of those people in my life. And Peter was one of those people in the life of Jesus. I don't believe that Jesus liked Peter better than he did Judas, but I do believe this is true. Uh, every one of us have people that are closer than other people. And if you're blessed enough in your lifetime to have people that were friends that become family, then you are blessed. Amen? Amen. And, and, and this is what Peter was. Peter was one of those guys that when the Mount of Transfiguration happened, uh, Jesus invited Peter up with him. I believe there are times in, in the life of, of, of and, it, and all of that stuff's not recorded in the Gospels, but I believe there were seasons of time when, when Jesus was walking through just hard moments, maybe where, where he just maybe was disappointed with what happened during the day or maybe some of the rejection that he was facing or maybe the pressure that was on him that he would pull away with some of his friends, some of his close friends. I think Peter, James, and John were those guys where he would just pull over and say, guys, I just need some extra prayer today. We all got some people in our life, I hope, that we decided, I didn't, I didn't, that we can go to and we say, we just need some extra prayer today, you know? That was his brother. That was his brother. But check out what he did. Peter followed at a distance and said, and this is after Jesus was arrested. Now, this was, this was prophesied, and, and, and Jesus actually spoke to Peter and told him this was going to happen, his brother, you know? Uh, that a servant girl saw him, and she said about Peter, this man was with him, talking about Jesus. And he said, woman... I do not even know him. Have you had one, have you had somebody in your family at some point tell you, uh, tell tell everybody we don't know you? you? That'd be hard to come back from, right? Later, another saw him and said, "You were also one of them." And Peter said, "I am not." And an hour passed. Another affirmed, "Surely, as he was with." Peter said, "Man, I do not know what you are even saying." And immediately the rooster crowed. There, there, there's some reference in, 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 in commentary that it, it even goes deeper than that. Peter, Peter even was able to was, was even say something like this. Cursed be my life if I even knew who he was. That's how desperately he denied Jesus. Now, that's, that's, that's hurtful, right? So he's, he's, be, he's been betrayed by a brother and, and, that, and, and now denied by, uh, betrayed by a friend and now even being denied by a brother. I mean, at what point, at what point would we look at the life of Jesus and say, you know what, man, I don't blame you. I wouldn't do it either. Just, I mean, these people don't, this is a guy that you, that, that you use as your example when you were making sure that disciples even understood why you came, why you came. Y'all remember that story? He looks at Peter and says like, why, what, I mean, what, what, who, who do they say I am? Well, some people say you're Elijah. Some people think you. Da, 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 da. He said, "Well, who, who do y'all say I am?" And Peter, Peter said, well, you're, we, "We know that you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God." This, that's how close they were, and he denied him. So, not only that, but check this out. He was also next verse humiliated and mocked by his enemy. I mean, not. It's it's one thing to get hurt by people that are close friends with you, but now now you're getting mocked. Now, you know, for, for for what? What, what was it exactly that Jesus did that deserved to be humiliated and mocked? It said this, the men who, who held Jesus mocked and blindfolded him and struck him. As, with his blindfold on, they would come up to him and just hit him. Just hit him. And, 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 then, and then in, in a mocking kind of way, they would prophesy, who was it that hit you? Which one of Who hit you this time? And then they would back away and hit him. I mean, can, can you imagine? It's just, just, just total humiliation. The next thing I noticed in, uh, later on in chapter 22 is this. Uh, abandoned by the church. 
<laughs> wow. I mean, you, you would think that, that you, at least you could count on the church at some point making the right decision. How many times have we had this conversation in this room? How, how many times have I said to you guys, there are only two groups of people that can really hurt you to the, to the core of your being, and that's your family and your church. I know what I'm talking about here. I, I've spent, I spent most of my childhood injured. I mean, like church hurt to the degree that I, I, only, I didn't even know how to put it into words or to describe it as a kid. I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about it for years because of, of the hurt that I felt. There, there are people in this room that are in this room right now because of church hurt, that people, people have hurt you in other places. And I'm not, I'm not trying to judge them. I'm not even judging the church that I, was, that I grew up in. I'm just telling you it's a reality, that, that, that church hurt is a real thing. And, and, you would, and, and you would think from, from Jesus' perspective, he's, he's like, man, these, these elders and these Pharisees, if anybody's going to know the truth, the one, it should be the ones that's been studying the prophecy about who I'm going to be and what I'm going to look like and what I'm going to accomplish. And, I'm, and I'm, feel, I'm, feeling that, I'm fitting the bill for every one of these things. And, and, and you would think if there was anybody that was going to stop the onslaught of humiliation and mocking and betrayal, it would be the church. One of the reasons that I feel like our goal as a church is that we be a, a church that brings healing to people is because of all of the hurt that I walked in in the church when I was a kid. I mean, I'm telling you, y'all, and I've told you this before. I mentioned it even last week. There, there was a season in my life where I, I, didn't, I, didn't ever, I didn't care if I ever went back near a church, much less, much less go join one. And, 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 and because Jesus, uh, I saw in Scripture where he, he faced this, this, this church betrayal, this church hurt, this, this, this church turning the back on him that, that I, I, I said, man, you know what? If, if he can keep putting one foot in front of the other, so can I. Amen? He said, when the day had come, the chief elders and the priests and, 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 and the scribes, I got bigger, chief priests and the scribes came and led him into their council saying, are, are you the son of God? And he said, you rightly say I am. What more testimony do we need? We've heard it from his own mouth. <laughs> He's acknowledging the agreement with Scripture, and they judge him for it. So, so think about it. That's a, that's a lot of stuff already, right? That's what, four things already? Look, look, look what else I found in, 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 the, in the part that can really be hurtful to him. Uh, condemned by the culture. He was condemned by the culture. I mean, listen to what it says. The whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and, for, and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, which is a lie. It's an absolute lie. I mean, if he hadn't had enough reasons to stop already, not only, not only has he now been, 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 been like betrayed by a friend and denied by his brother, not, not only has he been uh, crushed and humiliated and mocked, not only has he been like betrayed by the church now, but now he's being condemned by the culture. Oftentimes when people get, get in really, really hurt spaces in the body of Christ, they'll keep chasing culture until they find somewhere where they fit. That's why we have gangs and people oftentimes get involved in, 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 in drug violence and different things like that because, and cults. Because when the, the church hurts them, they, 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 they take off and find somebody, somebody somewhere that will accept them. And even with Jesus, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't even find it in the culture. And then finally, the, the, the last thing before the cross is he's fell by his government. I mean, Herod and his men treated him with contempt. You would expect, you would think that there would be some parameters in place, some provision put in place where when people are condemning you to hell and to judgment and to the cross, that there would be some stipulation within the parameters of government that would stop this from happening but instead, Herod and his men treated him with contempt, mocked him, arrayed him in a robe, and sent him back to Pilate, demanding he be crucified. And the voices of the men and the chief priests prevailed, and Pilate said, as it should be, as you requested. And he released one they requested, Barabbas. Remember him? One arrested for rebellion and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. This was a guy who had actually already been found guilty and was actually a murderer and a robber, and, 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 and they were... And they were the, 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 the culture ultimately was given the choice by the government. Who, who do you want me to release? I hadn't really found that much wrong with Jesus, but 
uh, I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to give you a choice of these two people. A guy who's been tried and found guilty of, of rebellion and murder and robbery or Jesus. And they chose the release of the murderer. And the government backed that and said, okay, it is as you ask. Let's kill him. And then finally the cross. Man, have we not had enough reasons already for him to walk away? But now look, he, he's, he's getting ready to be condemned to the cross. I mean, like, you know, we were talking on Wednesday night. There's, 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 there's some, we were studying about picking up your cross every day and following after Jesus. And, and one of the things we talked about on Wednesday night is, is, is they knew what was up when, when it came to the cross. When, when they read that scripture in Luke 9 about pick up your cross and follow Jesus, they, they knew what that meant. One of the things that was always true about the cross is this, is if you were standing on the side of the road and you saw a guy walk by dragging a cross, you knew that was a walk they weren't coming back from. If you saw a guy carrying a log on his back and guards walking beside of him, you knew he was about to face a horrendous, horrendous, as bad as you could find kind of death. And Jesus did that too. They, they took him and they, they beat him with 39 stripes. You know why they didn't do 40? Because they thought 40 would kill him. In fact, the death penalty would be 40. So they last Jesus 39 times and then they put a cross on his back and made him carry up, up this hill to Golgotha to die. Not for, not for his failure, but for my failure. Man, I don't know about y'all, but if I, if I was the son of God, I mean, just in the, and, and, and you think of him in the natural just for a second, and you'd watch the betrayal, and you'd watch the denial, and you'd watch every point of reference in your life had let you down and condemned you to this death. I'm going to tell you something. But before we get to the part where they're going to nail my hands to this thing and my feet to this, I'm about to call on daddy's angels. And yet Jesus did what? Like a lamb to slaughter, he did not open his mouth. Why? What, what motivates somebody to, to do that? And the answer to the question is you. The answer to the question is me. I hung him on that cross and, 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 and he, he refused to not go to the cross. He had a lot of opportunities to refuse the cross, but the one thing that he refused was the not to do the cross. I mean, now, now I want you to think about this for a second. Think of all the betrayal, all the denial, and all those places and spaces where he, he I mean, that, there, there, I don't think there's anybody who has ever lived on the earth, ever lived on the earth that went through what Jesus went through on our behalf. Amen. There's another man. Uh, this is kind of where I want to shift gears for a second. Uh, we'll get back to the cross in just a second and the resurrection. But I want to let you in on something that was, it was one of the most important, I think one of the most important miracles of my life uh, a few years ago. Uh, I, I met a, a man by the name of Mr. Bennett Blankenship. Uh, and uh, I'm going to put his picture up here in his uh he was airborne. You can see that. He was stationed and in, in, trained in Fayetteville. He was 82nd Airborne. And uh, I wrote down, uh, he, he spent 23 years in the military and uh, retired as a command sergeant major. Now, if you want to go look up uh, the, the E-9 of that, for you people that are military-minded, you'll know that was pretty high ranking to be lifted to. Uh, but he spent 23 years uh, in, in the military. I met him when he was 80 years old. Uh, that's not him at 80. That's probably him uh, at 40. But uh, I never met a man 80 years old and this tall that I was as terrified of as I was this little man. <laughs> he was a tough guy. Uh, his wife had called me out to come and see him at his house. Miss Chris, she went home to be with Jesus uh, a couple of months ago, and she, she said, I, uh, Bennett's asking for you to come and see him. And I went, I literally did that. My eyes went, 
because his, his reputation kind of preceded him. He, he wasn't the friendliest guy in the whole wide world. Uh, uh, he was not just a hardcore military guy, but a hardcore military guy that had seen a lot of stuff. He, he did five tours in Vietnam. Uh, I've, never, I've never known or heard of anybody to do five tours in Vietnam. And uh, He saw so much stuff about it. The one thing that he would rarely talk about, uh, even, even late in life, was what happened in Vietnam. I'm just telling you, he saw more stuff and went through more hurt than maybe anybody I've, I've ever known. I, I don't know for sure, but from my opinion, that's what he went through. The only thing that he did tell me about Vietnam is when we were having a conversation one day, he, he said, uh, I said, why did you stay for five tours in Vietnam? Why would you, why would you do that? I mean, why, why five tours? You didn't have to stay for five tours. And he told me, he said, two reasons. Number one, I didn't know if I could fit anywhere else after this which told me more than, I, than he said. And secondly, he said, because I do believe I was saving people's lives. And I, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, oftentimes, he said, because I'd been there for so long that they would, they would bring these guys on these buses that were like college educated uh, and they were actually higher in rank than me. He said, they would get off the bus and they would be like, Let's go get them. And he would say, right, come here, guys. I need to tell y'all in for a meeting. And they would be like, uh, you can't be having meetings with us. We're, we're actually over you. And he was like, okay, well, you, you, you call it what you want to call it, but here's the deal. If you want to live, follow me and do what I tell you. And if you want to die, don't. Because that's just the way he was. He was that blunt. So you can only imagine my excitement when he calls for me to come visit him. Again, I say his, his reputation preceded him. I, the only thing I really, really knew about him was that, uh, besides that I knew Gary and, and I knew Miss Chris and I knew his nephew who's back here in our sound booth. And I knew that every one of them really, really had a high admiration for, from, for him, but they were all a little bit scared of him. And he wasn't that big of a man. He was just this big, I promise you, but they were all a little bit like, he's a good guy. Well, you, you, don't make him mad. And I'm like, what? and so I knew one story about Nathan. Aaron, you'll remember this. Uh, Nathan uh, lived right beside of Mr. Blankenship. And, uh, and so one day, Mr. Blankenship walked over to the fence that he had put up uh, between him and Nathan's yard because he didn't really like people in his yard. And so he put up a fence, and Nathan's out in the yard doing some work, and Mr. Blankenship says, hello, hey. And Nathan's like, you know, Nathan, Nathan's like one of the nicest human beings that's ever lived on the earth, right? I mean, like... He is. I mean, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan loves humans more than anybody I think I've ever met. And he thought to himself, wow, Mr. Blankenship wants to talk to me. And so he, he called me. He goes, hey, how are you doing? He goes, stop right there. He says, that's close enough. He goes, are you the one that mows your yard? And Nathan's like, well, maybe he wants me to mow his yard sometime, you know? You know he says, yeah, yes, sir, I do. He goes, from now on when you're mowing it, can you, can you face your mower the other way? You threw grass in my yard last week, and don't let it happen again. <laughs> and do y'all have a yellow cat? <laughs> Nathan said, yeah. He goes, well, you're not going to have it for long because it was in my yard yesterday. <laughs> and it, Nathan was like, okay. And Mr. Blankenship just walked off. <laughs> so this is the guy I'm going to visit on this Thursday. And so uh, Miss Chris w meets me at the door. Mr. Mr. Blankenship had had a surgery not too long before that. He was sitting on a recliner in the living room. And so she said, come on, I'll take you to where Bennett is. And so she took me in there, and she sat me down right here, and she said, all right, Mike, it's good to see you. And she left. <laughs> and in my heart I went, Yay. <laughs> we knew I had a little bit of a military family background, so we talked, you know, briefly about that. But uh, as, as was his nature, he got straight to the point, and he said this question to me. He asked me, he said, I got one question. I got one question only. I won't keep you long. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Blankenship. I didn't, you know, I was yes, sir, and no, sir. And like, he was my commander, you know, so honestly. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I got one question, one question only. Can you explain to me one thing? I said, what is it? He goes, can you explain to me how you have the audacity to think that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Let me explain. Well, I wasn't going to stop him. 
He said, I've, I've served in the military all over the world. He goes, I've served in countries that are Muslim countries. I've served in Buddhist countries. I've served in Hindu countries. I've served in countries where people were in every kind of religion. He goes, number one, he said, sometimes the people were in that religion were way nicer to me than Christians have been. Number two, I've met more people who are more devoted to their faith than most Christians I've ever met are. He said, can you explain to me how somebody can be that devoted that polite, that nice, and that committed to what they believe in, and then you think yours is the only way. And I thought, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, and one I better have an answer for. And I briefly closed my eyes, and I said, Spirit of the living God, you remember your promise in your word that said, if I don't know what to say, that you will speak through me. And I opened my eyes and I said, that's easy, Mr. Blankenship. He said, what is it? I said, well, when I was 18, I said, I was mad at the world. I was mad at the church. I said, I was just mad at Christians in general. And so I, I took a class in, in college where I studied the religions of the world because I figured it might be a good time for me to find out what all of them believed and maybe even find out who was right. And I said, at the end of the day, here's what I did. I discovered this to be the truth. If you go to the grave of Muhammad, he's in it. If you go to the cave of Buddha, he's in it. I said, but if you get on a plane right now and you ride to Israel and you take one of those tours where they take you on a tour to where Jesus was buried, what you're going to find out is the stone still rolled and he ain't there. Well, I don't know at this point if Mr. Blankenship's impressed, but I am. I said, sir, and I'm ready to talk now. Sir, thinking me and him was going to have about a 30-minute discussion. I said, sir, I decided if I was going to wage my life and my eternity on any one religion, then I'm going to go with the one who ain't dead no more. And he looked at me and he went, nothing, crickets. And I'm going, I know what's getting ready to happen. It's getting ready to be one of those Jesus moments. I've led people to the Lord many, many times, and I feel it coming. And he, after about what well, seemed like an hour and a half, he said, I appreciate you coming by. <laughs> I'll call you back up if I have any more questions. Chris! And she led me right out the front door, and I was like, I mean, y'all even got to admit, that was pretty good. <laughs> exactly one week later, Seven days later, I get a call in my office. It's Miss Chris. She said, Bennett wants you to come back. <laughs> I'm like, man, I don't know if I can go today. I'm going to take me like a crash course in the Bible and start thinking like, what could be the next question? <laughs> and then I opened my mouth and said, I'll be there in 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes later, I walked into the front door, knocked on the door. She meets me at the door. She said, Bennett's laying in his bed. He wants you to come back in there. I said, yes, ma'am. I'll do whatever he says to do. And I walked back to his bed. And when I got back in his room, I knew something was different. You know what I knew? I saw beside of his leg a Billy Graham book. And at his knee, the Bible. Amen. And I went, today's the day. <laughs> he said, I only got one question. I went, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> I thought I covered it all last week. He said, I only got one question, and this is it. I said, what is it? He goes, do you think that Jesus that accepted you will take me? I said, he would love to. He goes, well, let's pray then. And he grabbed my hand with the softest squeeze, and he said, you go first. And I prayed what I could pray. I, by now, I'm just, and I look at him and tears are just streaming, falling onto his pillow. And we actually both prayed a little bit and uh, I stood up and he said, 
I feel better. <laughs> and I went, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Blank. He said, well, I feel better too. I thought you might cut me today. <laughs> he said, no, I like you. I said, well, I'm sure glad you do. Over the next three years, we became great, great friends. A couple months after I got another picture, uh, I baptized him. He ain't big as... He ain't big as a minute, but he would stomp you if he needed to. <laughs> I've never been more scared of an 80-year-old in my life. I saw him mad one time. First off, I'll tell you something. He had a total transformation of heart. The way he loved his wife was perfect. The way he loved, began to love his son in a new way, his nephew in a new way, his family in a new way, his love for me. I mean, I could not wait to go see him, and I went often just to hang out with him. And every time I would come, he would grab my hand and hold it. I bet he ain't held a man's hand in his whole life. You know what I'm saying? Like he would just grab my hand and hold it. The whole, we became buddies. I'm telling you, he became one of my best buds. And we were on this picture where we get, I'm getting ready to baptize him. We, we're getting ready to come into the baptismal pool. I said, Mr. Bennett, I said, you can, I always called him Mr. Bennett, no matter what. I said, Mr. Bennett, I said, you know, you're going to get a chance. He said, no, this is my public profession. He goes, and, and I would say something, but I won't be able to. And his little voice broke. He said, just tell him that I'm grateful for what Jesus did. He, he changed my life and gave me a new heart. Amen. A few years later, I was able to do his funeral, and I shared with them what I just shared with you. And I don't know if y'all know the statistics, but you know that people, most people that get saved, and you, depending on which which statistical thing, but they all agree it's pretty close, that between 85 and 92% of people that get saved, get saved before they're 20. And that of all the other rest of people in the world that are saved, that all of, all out of the 100% of people that get saved, 97% of them will get saved before they're 30. I don't know what the statistical information, because there wasn't any on what, what, what 80 year old people getting saved, but I won't guarantee it's about zero. But Jesus, Jesus can come through in a minute, even when you think it's zero. Amen. He said, Mike, I appreciate you leading me to Jesus. He said, I said, what was the turning point? He said, well, just common sense, son. <laughs> he said, he looked right at me like I didn't know this. He said, if you were going to give your life to something, I think it makes sense to go with the one who's alive. I said, yeah, that's a good idea. I should have thought of that. <laughs> Today, I, I want to honor him and I want to honor Miss Chris. And, but mainly, I want to just honor the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen. for not being in the tomb today. Amen. 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 For not being in the tomb today. One of the things he encourages us to do in Scripture is to remember. And uh, today we're remembering you, Jesus. We are remembering you today, Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, I think it is, he, he says, As oft as you drink of this cup and eat of this bread, remember me. And what it is, is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a remembrance of what this blood and this cup represent. And so this Wednesday, this past Wednesday, LCA did a, a beautiful day, Miss Audrey. I loved it. Where is she? She was over like a, a beautiful, beautiful day where they brought the parents in and, and the kids in, and they did, uh, Miss Grace did an incredible teaching on why, why the bread and why the cup. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you something. We're going to do it a different way today. We're not going to do it together. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to let you guys get with your families and do this, but I want I wanted to remind you of two things. Uh, number one, what the, what, the, what the bread represents. And the bread represents simply this, just in a common sense way. The, the, the bread represents the broken body of Jesus. When he broke the bread and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples, he said, do this in remembrance of me. This, this, this bread represents a broken body. In other words, the fact that Jesus would, would, would allow them to stripe his backs for our healing. That Jesus would allow them. See, let me tell you something. The enemy didn't come and take Jesus to the cross. Jesus took himself to the cross. 
The enemy didn't beat him with 39 lashes. Didn't capture him and, and kidnap him and beat him with 39 lashes. Let me tell you something. Jesus walked in there and took those 39 lashes for a reason. Do you know why? Because Isaiah was already written, by your stripes we are healed. So when you take this bread today, I want you to thank him for it. Thank you that your body was broken for me, not for, not for your failure, but for my failure. And then when you take this cup, I want you to remember this. Thank you that, that a new covenant was written by your blood that I might come into relationship with you, that I might be called a son of God. Why does he want us to remember? How many times have I said this? You keep remembering so you don't forget. That you're not going to get to go to heaven one day because you were good. You're going to get to go to heaven because he was good. You're not going to get to go to heaven because you got it right. You'll get to go to heaven because he got it right. Because he was willing to have his body broken and his blood spilled for me. I want you to stand with me and I want you to gather with your families. My family is welcome to join me right up here at the front. Or if anybody doesn't have a family and you want to come join me and my family up front, you're welcome to. But Val is going to sing this song over you. Val is going to sing this song over you in a minute. And as she sings this song, I want you with your families to, to pass out the bread and drink the cup and remember him today. If you don't remember any story I told or any, anything I said, I want you to remember him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Today we come into this room to remember you. We remember that your tomb's empty. We remember that your body was broken. We remember that your blood was spilled. And we acknowledge and love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, spread out.